Kinnit the second week in the month of May. Expectedly, it is time once again for a comprehensive recap of major events that occurred in the course of the outgoing week. It is called The World This Week. We shall set sailing with the regular news tidbits from both the national and international scenes to update and keep you abreast with up to speed timelines of events. On the second segment, we shall serve you a refreshing but memorable package, kicking off with the foreign news recap. This is to followed by the sports round of while entertainment news highlighting unforgettable dramas, musical videos, and interviews would also take its place in the lineup. As usual, Saturday special that searches deeper into societal events with a view to unhealthy eating issues shall wrap up the entire package on the news program, The World This Week. Sit back and enjoy the package. I am Idowu Fabadu, your uncle. <laughs> And just before we begin, let's tell you this. Inspiration is a guest that does not willingly visit the lazy. The Ogun State Chapter of Inter-Party Advisory Council, IPAC, has dismissed the petition seeking disqualification of Governor Dakwa from the 2023 general elections as spurious and a calculated attempt to disparage his personality. The petition written and signed by one Ayo Dele Uludiran on behalf of a group, according to Ogun IPAC, lacks substance and should be disregarded in its entirety. It further describes the petition as worthless and demands no recognition from the petitioner who is not a credible public commentator. Therefore, Ogun State IPAC wish to bring to the attention of all and sundry that His Excellency Prince Dakwa Biodo is well educated with variable facts and a seasoned administrator for excellence, whose corporate experiences have reflected in the ongoing transformational changes in Ogun State. We are in the political season. Therefore, all manner of character assassination strategies will be deployed to smear and tarnish all personalities of leading political gladiators. It is, however, imperative to state that the performance of His Excellency Prince Dagwabi Odun MFF in the last three years is legendarily and enviable. There is no doubt that the fact that Ogun State has witnessed a total turnaround in all ramifications. IPAC, however, called on Governor Dakwa Biodu not to be distracted by the petition but to remain focused in his assignment of transforming Ogun State. It assured that no amount of blackmail or character assassination against Governor Biodu will sway people's belief in him and is bid to win a second term in office next year. The Onogorua family of Odo, Bolu in Odo, Bolu local government area of Ogun State, has disclaimed a write-up purportedly written by a family member attacking the personality of Governor Dakpo Abiodun. The family, in a letter signed by the family head of Onogorua and Babaoba of Odo, Bolu Kingdom Emeritus, Professor Tola Atimo and the Secretary of Onogorua Descendants Union, Reverend Wiley Onogorua, described the write up as features. An acclaimed member of Onogorua family, AOO Olu Onogorua, had written against Governor Abiodun, tagging him a governor without honor and dirty secret. But in a statement by the Onogorua family, AOO, who claimed to be a writer and a vegetable based farmer based in Elish Remo, was disowned, saying such a person never existed in the family. According to the family, 
there is no a person in the family with such a name and based in Elysian Remo asking Governor Abiodo and members of the public to disregard such a write-up. The All Progressives Congress, APC in Ogun State, has announced that the screening exercise for all hours of assembly aspirants in next year's general elections will hold tomorrow, Sunday, the 15th of May, 2022. The exercise will be held at the Party State Secretariat, Iyano Mochari Abiolawe Abeokuta, in the morning. A statement by the Party Organizing Secretary, Yeni Adilani, also states that all the aspirants are to come to the exercise with six photocopies of their credentials, photocopies of their forms and their original certificates. More people continue to throw their hats into the ring as they joined the fray for the 2023 presidential election. To this end, Nigerians have been expressing concern at the proliferation of the contest across the two major political parties. In this special report, Matthew Shomi takes a look at the clog of political space by the high number of aspirants jostling for the coveted office in the land. His report. Who are qualified to, con to contest, but who are not serious contenders? Who will just want to take anything cheap by the roadside and assert what they call their rights and create problems for our party? Justifying the reason why the party is charging 100 million naira for the party's nomination form, National Chairman of Ruling All Progressive Congress, Senator Abdullahi Adamu, said it was because of the importance of the office of the Nigerian president and to reduce the number to only serious contenders. As at the last count, about 30 people have already purchased the All Progressive Congress presidential nomination forms, while more people continue to signify interest in the major opposition party, People's Democratic Party. Those who have shown interest from the ruling APC include the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshimbaju, Ministers, Senate President Ahmed Lawal, serving and former governors, APC National Leader Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, and others. If a group of people can collect a form, 100 million, and we are our education sector, it's not working. I think we need to go to the drawing board. You know, it's one of the job of politics. If at the end of the day, the said people should aspire for the presidency of this nation and you don't see people, which means things has, has gone wrong somewhere. But, uh, but uh, the number of people aspiring this time around is too bogus and it may not be okay for the polity of Nigeria. Even people who normally pontificate with cultural certainty about politics in Nigeria are mystified by the all commons presidential primary contest. Nigerians have, however, been reacting to the proliferation of the number of aspirants for the office of the president with the belief that this will create more challenge for not just the political parties, but the political terrain. Um, I know that there will be a lot of gladiators that will come up for our presidency, uh, vying for that position, and that is to show how lucrative that office is. There isn't that about that. Um, but definitely, um, we're not shocked by the number of watchers because we knew that there will be a way to want to control and stem what is happening. And that's why the huge amount of 100 million. But eventually it didn't. Well, I, I believe that um, the political class have um, make us to believe that um, whether we like it or not, they have empowered themselves very well and they have the money to pick the form. The ask for the interests of the nation and the people to be put first in the selection of candidates among the crowd of aspirants by the political parties. Matthew show me OGTV News. The Ogun State Governor, Prince Dapo Abiodo, has described a former deputy governor in the state, Senator Adigwe Ngakaka, as a pragmatic leader who has contributed tremendously to the growth of the state. Governor Abiodo gave this commendation during the 70th birthday celebration of Senator Kaka Ed at Ijebuigbo in Ijebu North Local Government. Governor Abiodun said Senator Kaka deserved the celebration and the quality of the gathering having served the state in different capacity meritoriously.
Other dignitaries at the event also lauded Senator Kaka's impact in the state, describing him as a strong and significant character. The celebrant said clocking 70 for him is emotional. I passed through a lot, then with luck and benevolence of Almighty God, I'm what I am. I started rough from the lowest of the low rank. And I was born into wealth, but the wealth vaporized. But later in life, after struggling, believing in God, and then standing by what God has in store for me, I'm what I am today. Governor Abiodun later directed courting of the birthday cake and launched a book about the life and times of the celebrant. Full details of the event will be brought to you in our subsequent bulletins. On to education matters now. The Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, JAM, has released the result of the 2022 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination. The board, in a statement, directed candidates who sat for the examination to check their results by texting send UTME results, one word, to 55019 to have their results. To check the 2022 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination result, all a candidate needs to do is to simply send UDME result to 55019 using the same phone number that he or she had used for res registration and the result would be returned as a text message, the statement read. The 2022 UTME began on Friday 6th May 2022 and ended on Friday, 13th May 2022. Processes that would lead to the emergence of a new set of leadership in Ogun State Council of Nigeria Union of Journalists have begun as screening of voters for the forthcoming Ogun NEJ elections has been rounded off at the Iweruin Okeilewo Abeokuta. Practicing journalists from various media organizations in Ogun State participated in a four-day screening exercise of Dwayo Oriyeni was there and she reports. The four-day screening exercise of the Nigeria Union of Journalists, Ogun State Council, has ended. Journalists from different chapels across the state trooped out to participate in the exercise. Existing and new members of the union assembled at Iweiruni, Okeilewo Abeokuta, to get accredited on a daily basis during the exercise. The aim was to enlist members who are eligible to vote and be voted for during the forthcoming union elections. Speaking with the Screening Council Committee members, it was revealed that the screening would allow easy identification of qualified journalists and to also ensure unity and restoration of sanity in the union as well as members. They are trying to have a kind of damage control. And uh, by the Congress today, we, we hope that sanity will return and we will have a respectable executive in the state NUJ. We needed to do something to change the scenario and make sure things are in order. A few of the members who took part in the exercise disclosed that the screening was fair and well coordinated. It's normal. It's what is expected, you know, that we should do. It's what, what we always do uh, most of the times, you know, when you need to revalidate membership of um, the union. I mean, it's the right process in the right direction. The exercise has been peaceful, everybody has been conducting themselves in an orderly manner. And if you see, look at behind me, everybody, even the, those who are in charge are also um, welcoming and um, they're doing, they are so professional with their job. I want to believe that after this exercise, Ogwenyu will be able to move forward. Ogwenyu will be able to move to the next level of its life. The chairman of the Screening and Revalidation Committee, Barista Demola Badejo, affirmed that Members of the council would vet all the documents submitted and confirm the eligibility of members who came forward for the exercise. The seemingly intractable differences amongst the members 
has now been finally laid to rest. At a press conference which wrapped up the four-day screening exercise, questions were poised for the committee while answers were provided on the assignment just concluded based on the progress of the union and the commitments of the members. Odua Yo Uriyeni, OGTV News. The Radio, Television, Theater and Art Workers Union of Nigeria, Ratawu's Ogun State Council, led by its chairman, Comrade Ido Wurotimi, has paid a courtesy visit on the management of Ogun State Television, OGTV. The chairman, who was in company of their executive members, in an interview noted that the visit was to identify with the management of OGTV and solicit support in driving the union to an enviable height. When we come together, when we work together, we'll be able to achieve the best meaningfully, effectively, and efficiently in Nogo State. The members, they should cooperate. Everybody, the state Tesco, we should work as an entity so that we can be able to point to one or two things that we are be able to achieve at the end of our tenure. And now to the federal government who has disclosed that more Nigerians are getting vaccinated against the COVID-19 pandemic as a total of 41,319,969 persons have received at least one dose of the vaccine. According to data from National Primary Health Care Development Agency, NPHCDA, as of May 11, 2022, in all the 36 states plus the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, 24,840,345 eligible persons targeted for COVID-19 vaccination have been partially vaccinated, while 16,479,624 have been fully vaccinated. He further disclosed that the country has now exceeded a 230,000-day vaccination rate with Nasarawa, Jigawa, Kano, Kaduna, and Kwara leading the number one vaccinations across the country. The executive director of the NPHCDA, Dr. Faisal Shuhai, who made this known at a gathering organized by the staff of the agency to celebrate his recent National Productivity Order of Merit Award by President Mohammed Buhari at the Asovila during the 19th National Productive Day, described the award as an invitation and impetus to more work to protect the lives of Nigerians. The federal government has raised the alarm over the rising rate of crude oil theft in the Niger Delta, disclosing that about $3.27 billion worth of oil has been lost to vandalism and theft in the past 14 months. The, governor, the, the government also said high level cases of oil theft has become a threat to the country's corporate and economic existence, with the industry now thinking of transporting crude oil from fields of export terminals by trucks. This came on a day the defense headquarters announced the destruction of 49 illegal refineries and arrest of 70 oil thieves and pipeline vendors in the Niger Delta. In a presentation at a stakeholders' engagement in Abuja, the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, NUPRC, said the government is extremely worried about the huge loss of oil revenue to vandals. We now take a break. Join us shortly for the rest of the package. Thanks for staying tuned. Away from the shores of the country now, at least 27 people have been killed and others are missing after a fire swept through a four-story office building in Delhi. 
more than 70 people were inside when the fire started and uh, witnesses said some jumped out of windows to escape. Women made up the majority of the office's workers. A short circuit is thought to have started the fire. Two brothers who owned a CCTV manufacturing company which was housed in the building have been arrested in connection with the incident. According to the authorities, police are also seeking to talk to the owner of the building. The group of seven leading economies have warned that the war in Ukraine is stalking a global food and energy crisis that threatens poor countries and urgent measures are needed to unblock stores of grain that Russia is preventing from leaving Ukraine. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, who hosted a meeting of top G7 diplomats, said the war had become a global crisis. Baerbock said up to 15 million people, particularly in Africa and the Middle East, would face hunger in the coming months unless ways are found to release Ukrainian grain, which accounts for a sizable share of the worldwide supply. In a statement released at the end of the three-day meeting on Germany's Baltic Sea coast, the G7 pledged to provide further humanitarian aid to the most vulnerable. North Korea has announced the first COVID deaths amid the explosive COVID-19 outbreak that was recorded killed six people. Also, the president of the oil rich Gulf state, the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Khalifa, who was rarely seen in public, has died at the age of 73. Let's now join Ayo Deji Ulumi for more on the world this week. Sri Lanka's Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaska has resigned after protests over the island's nation's worsening economic crisis turned deadly. In a statement on Monday, his office said he was quitting in order to help form an interim unity government following weeks of sometimes violent protests across the country over shortages of fuel and other vital imports and spiraling prices. Earlier, a government official said Roger Pasco, who has dominated Sri Lankan politics for nearly 20 years, and whose government crushed the Tamil Tigers to bring an end to a long civil war, has sent his letter of resignation to the president. In Shanghai, commercial food deliveries are not allowed, and access to hospitals for all what emergencies must be approved first. Neighbors of COVID 19 cases and others living close by have also been forced into government quarantine facilities. Shanghai is now in its seventh week of citywide restrictions. Confirmed cases have fallen significantly from their peak, but authorities have not yet been able to hit the target of what they call Societal Zero, where no cases are reported outside of quarantine facilities. Despite the tougher measures, Shanghai officials insist that people living in half the city's district are now free to leave their homes and walk around. Coal makes up more than two-thirds of India's energy needs, even as unseasonably hot weather illustrates the threat from climate change caused by burning fossil fuels. Soaring temperatures have prompted higher energy demand in recent weeks and left India facing a 25 million ton shortfall at a time when coal spot prices have skyrocketed since the start of the year. The Environment Ministry said it has allowed a special dispensation to the Ministry of Coal to relax certain requirements like public consultations so mines could operate at increased capacities. The relaxation comes after it received a request from the Ministry of Coal, stating that there is huge pressure on domestic coal supply in the country, and all efforts are being made to meet the demand of coal for all sectors. The Ministry of Presidential Affairs is manned to the UAE people, Arab and Islamic nations, and the world. The death of President is Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed al-Nayan, the official WAM news agency tweeted. 
The ministry announced 40 days of mourning with flags at half mast from Friday and work suspended in the public and private sector for the first three days. Sheikh Khalifa took over as the UAE's second president in November 2004, succeeding his father as the 16th ruler of Abu Dhabi, the richest of the Federation's seven Emirates. He has rarely been seen in public since 2014 when he had surgery following a stroke. Although he has continued to issue rulings, the cause of his death was not immediately released. North Korea has announced an explosive COVID-19 outbreak that has likely killed six people and infected more than 350,000 according to the state media, prompting fears of an impending and deadly crisis in the isolated and improvised nation. The announcement comes a day after the country reported its first ever coronavirus case, calling the situation a major national emergency. And just the North Korea reported 18,000 new fever cases and six deaths, one of which tested positive for the BA2 subvariant of Omicron. North Korea has not confirmed that all fever cases and deaths are COVID-19, likely due to its limited testing capability. A fever whose cause could not be identified exclusively spread nationwide since late April. As of now, up to 187,800 people have been isolated. And now into the world of sports. The Confederation of African Football has approved the Gulfstream Apabio International Stadium, Uyo, as the venue for this year's Confederation Cup final. This will be the first continental game to be held in the nest of champions. Also, the Minister of Youth and Sports Development has announced the withdrawal of all national basketball teams from all international tournaments for two years due to the lingering leadership crisis in the Confederation. Meanwhile, eight players have been announced by the English Premier League as the nominees for this year's Player of the Season Award. Emmanuel Dasaulu Asmo on Sports Roundup. All right, now we'll bring you the details shortly. We'll begin our entertainment segment of this edition of the program with a snippets of the 70th birthday of one of the biggest figures in the Nigerian movie industry, Adibayo Salami, popularly called Ogabilu. These and other stories are in our package tonight, again, put together by Tiwaladi Faisal. <laughs> Veteran actor Adebayo Salami, popularly known as Ogabelo, clocked 70 on Monday and shared some thoughts about his new age on his Instagram. Sharing a photo of himself, the actor noted that life made more meaning to him at 70 as he expressed gratitude to God for his family and career. Quoting him, life makes more meaning to me through the blessings of family and enduring legacies of my career. His popular actor son, Femi Adebayo, also celebrated the veteran on his Instagram page. Fellow actor and son of Ogabelo, Tokbe Adebayo, also wished his father a happy birthday as he shared a picture of the celebrant on his Instagram page. The children presented him a luxury car as gift, which the legendary actor received with emotion. <laughs> Nigerian gospel singer Steve Crown has shared how he narrowly escaped death after a ghastly car accident. In the video, Crown is an opportunity to.
Defending champion Igor Swiatek trashed Arena Sabalenka 6-2-6-1 to reach the final of the Italian Open in Rome. Swiatek was forced to withdraw from the Madrid Open with a short... The excellence of the educational system then translated to moral probity in private life and in public office. The general decay in the society today is a direct result of the poor state of education. In the past, teachers were held in high esteem and considered role models. But now, teachers are assaulted, maimed, and killed at will, even by their students, rather than being avenues for the inculcation of sound moral values. The last has not been heard about the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU's battle with the federal government over an agreement reached in 2009, but yet to be implemented. ASU is accusing government of poor commitment to the payment of academic and allowance, EAA, the continued use of the integrated personnel payroll information system and refusal to adopt the university's transparency and accountability solution, UTAS, among others. The fundamental principle why our university has degenerated is what you are paying your members. Universal is, university is universal. It's not about a, it's not a local thing. They didn't do anything. We were going from office to office. We met the senior president, speaker has a rep, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the, the speaker of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the president. We met the minister, a group intermediate council in Tassibe, to see how we can resolve this problem. They were all there, and we thought that with this one, it will work. So we have done all this. Not with uh, the chief of staff to the president. We have, and it didn't work. It's okay. Maybe if we go on a short strike, it will ginger that up and fix this problem that we are talking about. So we thought if we, if we, if we, if we go on a short strike, because the guys like what they it will ginger that up. The union has therefore vowed not to return to work unless the demands are met. This strike would be as long as the federal government fails to attend to our demands. As we speak, we have a, 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 a proposal between the federal government team and the ASU team on the table of government since May 2021. Until date, the government team has failed to even address any of the issues. For years in Nigeria, it has become a norm for students to spend more than their course duration in universities due to ASU strikes. Since 1999, Nigerian universities have been on strike for a cumulative period of three years. If there is anything that has been very constant in the academic calendar of the Nigerian universities since 2009, it is ASU strike. ASU need to bring about a new strategy. I have asked the question, what is in the demand of ASU? that no government in Nigeria has been able to meet. Obasanjo did not. Yanadua did not. Jonathan did not. PMB now at President Buhari, under his administration, is not equally not meeting ASU's demand. So what is in the demand? Can ASU come back and sit down and have a rethink on how to go about That is one. Number two, do they need to bring about a new strategy? Then I want to strike. I want to, you know, no, no government will sit down for them to go on like that. If they want to scrap us, I, I saw that coming. Major problem has always been the, this payment platform. And for goodness sake, we, we work elsewhere. How can an employee dictate to the employer the way the employer is going to pay or the platform on which the, the employer will pay? I, I, I really don't see sense in that. But having said that, I think it is time for everybody to sit down and find a lasting solution to it. It's a big, deep one. And I believe ASU should engage more now that we are going to the next election. They have to really, really engage more now to take their demands, to make sure that they have real demands and they can negotiate well. The Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, JAM, is still going ahead to organize its statutory examination. And here, at one of its CBT centers, are admission seekers who don't know when their results will be put to use 
as there is a time frame when their results will be put to use as there is a time frame for their results validity. It's a serious issue in Nigeria because I could remember when I was a student too, we had to go on strike for about two years and I don't know when this will, will get resolved. I, but I, but my, my best hope is that um, every member of the community, the families and everybody, they should push the government into doing the right thing. Because if they don't, like I said, when I was a student, I lost two years to strike. The coming words, these students too, they will still undergo that and we don't know when it will end. It's really bad, but still, we need to get prepared for the future. Schools have been shut for close to four months. Lecturers are now idle as union members fight the federal government to meet their demands, while the students remain the proverbial grass suffering where two elephants, the federal government and us who fight. We are also parents. Some of our, of our senior colleagues, they have kids in the universities, they have kids in the in polytechnic that they have to pay. And another weapon, you know, is not new. What the federal government does is that whenever us go on strike, as well as an as, uh, as a, as a organization, whenever we go on strike, you know, they, they resort to you know, stopping our salaries and the rest. I'm, and as you all know, we are, we, are, we are used to that. I have four of my kids and my relations who are in universities. I have more than six whose school fees I pay. Who, 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 who I bear, me, I bear. So I'm also a parent. But the quality of the credit I'm getting, is it the same thing that child in Ghana, in South Africa, and the U.S. getting? The answer is no. In a swift reaction, the federal government has appealed to the striking lecturers to call off the strike, asks students to be patient, and hopefully something good will come out of their negotiation. I want to use this opportunity to call on the academic staff union and the universities to consider the flight of our students and call off the ongoing strike action. I have earlier directed the Chief of Staff, Honorable Ministers of Labor and Employment, Education, Finance, Budget and National Planning to immediately bring all parties to the negotiating table to again critically look at the gray areas in the demands of ASU and in fact all other university-based labor unions. Against what we told you earlier, news just coming in now that the All Progressives Congress, APC, in Ogun State has announced that the screening exercise for all House of Assembly aspirants in next year's general elections will now hold on Monday, the 16th of May, 2022. The exercise will be aired at the MTR Hall, opposite Presidential Lodge, Ibarra Jiare Abeokuta, from 7 in the morning. A statement by the party organizing secretary, Yemi Adilani, also states that all the aspirants are to come to the exercise with six copies of their credentials, photocopies of their forms, and their original certificates. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast for Sunday. <laughs>
Inspiration is a guest that does not willingly visit the lazy. Let's quickly remind you that you can watch us live on our social media platforms. We are on Apple, Roku, Facebook, and Android devices. You can also watch us live on our website, www.ogtv.com.ng slash live or email info at ogtv.com.ng. And that's it on the world this week. On behalf of everyone here, we say a very big thanks to you for watching OGTV. I am Idu Fabaju. Bye now.